Good morning. My name is Timothy Walker. I'm a researcher here at the Institute for Security Studies. And today I'm going to be discussing a presentation on World Maritime Day 2017, connecting ships, ports and people. Now, the increasing need for secure, safe and efficient shipping is driving the expansion of a number of ports around Africa. Uh, from the start, I want to make a point very clear um, to anchor this discussion. Africa will be growing. There will be more people, more markets, and more need for shipping in the future to supply uh, demand. Um, remember this, shipping already carries about 90% of everything. Um, with this comes the need for more ports, uh, which must also be the central engines for future development. Uh, but is this going to be happening? Most African ports were primarily built as sites to facilitate the export of resources and people from Africa to the rest of the world, and therefore were never really intended to support independent uh, development plans at national, regional, or continental levels. Uh, many existing ports, uh, for instance, in this regard, were situated badly and are not able to be expanded, uh, as mega cities are now enveloping many of them, limiting the available space to grow. As I say, to mark this year's World Maritime Day and its theme, uh, today we'll be looking at whether enough is being done to ensure that any and all developments are ultimately benefiting African people and African communities. It is the focus on people, I'll be arguing, uh, which will be breaking a cycle of marginalisation, dependency and reactiveness, which unfortunately has characterised most, but by no means all, of Africa's post-colonial relationship to the sea and uh, shipping and maritime industries. At the highest levels, connecting ships, ports and peoples is gratifyingly being uh, seen in many of the frameworks, strategies, charters and various other documents produced by the African Union. Um, so countries such as South Africa are also introducing comprehensive maritime transport policies and roadmaps uh, for becoming well connected as maritime nations. But um, a question we have to ask is, are these going to receive the support that they need? Uh, therefore, the topic for beyond today as well, and we must remember this is intended to be an ongoing and dynamic conversation, is how best we can ensure African ports, uh, ships, people are benefiting from ever-increasing global maritime connectivity, uh, because this will ulti ultimately be vital for the future implementation of all African maritime development plans and the realisation of the blue economy. Firstly, let us turn to look at some pertinent shipping facts um, so that we can better understand the context of today's conversation. Now, when it comes to African-owned or operated ships, uh, the picture might be a, a little discouraging. African-owned shipping, for instance, accounts for only about 1.2% of world shipping and about 0.9% of gross tonnage. This means Africa is relatively vulnerable, dependent and arguably missing out on opportunity to better benefit from and control um, maritime trade, it's fundamental lifeblood. Few African countries have uh, a substantial uh, shipping registry of any real significance. South Africa, um, a country with maritime interests and uh, maritime aspirations, has only a few ships flying its flag at sea. Um, now, one risk is that some countries who are looking to have more uh, ships flying their flags at sea or to better benefit from um, an increase in their registry is to operate what are commonly known as flags of convenience or open registries. Um, by lowering the regulatory costs associated with flying that flag, uh, some countries are able to offer large numbers of shipping owners uh, the cheapest and least regulated way of shipping goods and, uh, and resources um, for a fee. This means that goods and services can be supplied cheaply um, but will be ultimately, argue me, largely disconnected from the African countries uh, where the flag flies and will be based elsewhere. Um, effectively, the flag is, is rented in that regard. Liberia, as an example, has for years possessed uh, one of the largest ship registries in the world, but arguably struggles to um, authoritatively ensure that uh, all um, illegal practices uh, which can occur on a ship are prevented. Um, Therefore, in this regard, we wouldn't have as much agency as we might like or assume to control something which is fundamental to the future, shipping and trading. Flagging in this way might also mean that environmental corners are cut. Um, inefficient ships, for instance, might be used on African shipping routes because they're cheaper to use. Um, and these could be major sources of pollution. 
There is a statistic that the 16 largest ships in the world pump out more pollution than most of the world's cars combined. Unsafe ships might also be operated. Um, ships that might be considered unseaworthy or illegal elsewhere um, come to have a final lease on life. This puts people at risk, um, very relevant to safety of life at sea. Uh, ferries and transport ships, for instance, uh, are often overloaded and there have been many disasters in recent years. Um, old ones are often operating on lakes and inland seas as well. Um, and we're talking about World Maritime Day and um, it's an International Maritime Organization Day which is focused mostly on the law of the sea. But in Africa, under the strategies and charters, uh, inland seas and lakes are considered part of this domain, which is why it's part of today's conversation. Um, many of these ships, though, are almost a century old and some have sunk and been refloated. The MV Liemba in Tanganyika, for instance, is one such ship. Now, to sail on it is a nice story, um, but it's not going to be practical for future development plans. That's a brief look at shipping. Um, the costs and the economic importance of ports is now something we're going to explore. As I mentioned earlier, there will be growing numbers of ports, many increasing in volume and efficiency. Uh, historical ports in this regard, such as Dar es Salaam, Durban and uh, Abidjan, are being expanded where possible and their efficiency expanded where possible too. However, slow turnaround times and insecure anchorages are often creating bottlenecks, adding to costs, meaning the costs of importing and exporting are quite punishing in that regard. Therefore, incremental increases in the size and efficiency of existing ports is crucial, but it's not going to be enough. Um, and therefore, we have to consider as well that uh, even what we are, we are struggling to handle what we are shipping at the moment. The 2050 Africa's Integrated Maritime Strategy points out that African ports are only handling 6% of worldwide traffic, waterborne traffic, I should say, and approximately 3% um, of the worldwide container traffic. Um, therefore, while port issues are mostly being responded to in terms of improving their management, other more grander solutions are also being sought. Many of these are quite tantalizing, they promise much, but with a tendency so far arguably to deliver quite mixed results. Uh, here I specifically want to highlight some of the problems with megaports and their associated special or industrial development zones. Now there are many new and interesting developments around Africa's coast, but we're going to briefly here explore the Kenyan port of Lamu. Now Kenya is developing this area with a view to linking up to inland countries to provide a link for trading landlocked country goods to the rest of the world, especially South Sudanese oil. Um, it is therefore proposing to construct a transport corridor which would reach up to the South Sudanese and Ethiopian border. Now this particular plan has suffered from a number of setbacks, for instance the deteriorating security situation in the north of Kenya, the conflict going on in South Sudan and historically low international oil prices. Um, all of these are affecting potential revenue and benefits and preventing their, the construction and implementation of the development plans. This has raised some questions about the feasibility of the port and all its associated infrastructure. Um, interest in the port is therefore better seen not in a short-term perspective, from a long-term perspective, serving national and international uh, interests. It's also not the only site of such a development. Lamu and other mega ports are being constructed to plug into and service and be integrated into the networks for uh, growing East Asian markets as well as existing markets around the world. Uh, some of these uh, traditional ports uh, which are also competing are um, Mombasa in Kenya and Dar es Salaam in Tanzania. Here I'm looking at East Africa. Um, Lamu, for instance, is in competition with a similarly sized Tanzanian port called Bagamoyo, which would far surpass anything um, in size that currently exists. Um, ports are needed for the increase in shipping, but uh, a crucial point to emphasize is that uh, inland infrastructure and connectivity is going to be crucial to ensure that these ports aren't simply uh, terminals or nodes supplying resources to the rest of the world, but without that kind of necessary connection to the uh, coastal communities and inland communities. Um, surrounding societies have to benefit in this regard. Um, another thing we'll see, we have seen and we'll probably see more of is the creation of special development zones or industrial zones, which are associated or 
uh, built alongside ports. Some, such as Hucha in, in South Africa, have had sophisticated harbours and port infrastructure developed alongside them, um, and further incentives for manufacturers to uh, build factories and invest in these zones could be subsidised electricity, for instance. But the experience so far of many of these in throughout Africa is that they don't pan out quite as expected. Care must therefore be taken not to overpromise and underdeliver on these, um, especially given such projects are often very costly to construct and, uh, and national development hinges upon their success. Plus the fact that we in Africa are often um, approaching the rest of the world or being approached in a very dependent and unfortunately exploitable position. Now, some of the costs which could be associated with these projects include political costs. There could be local discontent at forced relocations or inadequate compensation that has been occurring in Lamu, for instance. And also economic failures if um, promised jobs do not materialise or um, there is not an improvement in the economic situation of people surrounding the ports. Other costs could be environmental in that regard. Um, habitats could be destroyed. These could be located in sensitive or potentially arable areas. Um, and also the um, factories which could come to these zones could be ones which are no longer profitable to operate elsewhere in the world because environmental regulations don't permit them to operate as well as they would like. Therefore, they will go to a zone which offers incentives and perhaps uh, fewer regulations than before. This is something, again, which I say we need to keep careful eye of when we look at developing blue economy initiatives and all the associated infrastructure with that. My argument, therefore, is we cannot simply be reactive to these development issues and initiatives. They're often foreign-led and driven, um, which is understandable given the necessary funding and skills are located overseas. Um, but when it comes to planning instructions, the linkage of these new port infrastructures, shipping infrastructures, and various other industries needs to be well explained and understood within the context of African, Africa's long-term development frameworks. A more proactive stance therefore needs to be adopted. Um, I'm gonna briefly look here at China's One Belt, One Road initiative. Um, Chinese investment in maritime and land transport infrastructure is going to enhance our ability to trade with China and other countries lying between Africa and China. But African countries and their development is not the central feature or object of this plan. In many places, the infrastructure being constructed, railways for instance, um, is going to be vital for future development. But we need to be reflecting on whether these have been constructed in a way which is going to ultimately tie into national, regional development, um, continental development plans, which are envisioning greater uh, political and economic integration in the future as well. Ensuring ships, ports and uh, various infrastructure is created is one thing, but ensuring that they are securely operating is quite another. Now, for this part of my talk, it's necessary to use um, African maritime piracy as a window into present and future issues and problems, because piracy could continue to be a major disruption to African ships, ports and people in the future. Um, but it could also be a hindrance in more covert and unsettling ways. Now, piracy adds a lot of costs uh, to trading and causes losses of revenue to African ports and coastal and um, coastal states. Um, especially given so many of them struggle to guarantee a high level of security for ships transiting or visiting their waters. Unfortunately, too few African countries possess, the, uh, possess adequate capability to patrol and control their waters. Uh, therefore, they're not able to prevent piracy and other maritime crimes as well. Or if these crimes occur, they don't often possess adequate ability to gather evidence and ensure that criminals are brought to justice afterwards. Therefore, if we look again to the future where there will be more, um, a greater number of ships in African waters, there could be more victims and therefore more pressure on authorities to do something and act in ways which ultimately might not be Afrocentric or orientated. Now, unfought piracy in this regard might provide a justification for um, power projection from the outside, as well as new companies or types of ways of trying to protect or fight against maritime crime many of which might not be well suited to long-term African security and defence capability. Now, I'd argue this is um, uh, quite, uh, quite evident in Djibouti, where many bases have been popping up in the last couple of years, 
to fight piracy. Um, there have been unprecedented moves by China and Japan, for instance, to um, to base um, overseas military forces or keep them supplied. This is something which is not part of has not been part of their foreign policy for many years. An indication of how seriously they are taking it. Um, but a lot of these um, bases are justified in terms of they'll support regional peace and security frameworks and initiatives. But ultimately, um, the linkage between Africa's existing strategies and development frameworks has not been clearly made still, and therefore they could be used. They could be used in a way which could influence regional politics in a way which was not uh, originally spelt out when they were created. Um, it's also suggested we are overlooking an opportunity here to discuss what African navies and coast guards should look like in the years to come and how we should uh, best secure African maritime zones and domains against crimes and threats to things like food security. Um, <clears throat> it will become apparent from many of you who have watched some of these previous views on Africa that piracy casts a very long shadow over all discussions on African maritime security. Um, therefore, I'd like to move away from it to discuss what I promised at the beginning as the most important part of uh, this year's World Maritime Day theme, and that is people. And by people, I don't just mean seafarers and port workers, but all who support maritime industries and who will benefit from the blue economy, in a wider sense, all of us. Um, I would argue a very important economic opportunity is being lost unless greater numbers of African seafarers are being trained. In this regard, it's a rather strange and sad irony to hear that the development, the exciting development of autonomous or remotely piloted or crewless vessels is um, being driven often by um, claims of uh, maritime labour shortages. Um, and this is why we have so few African seafarers at sea and uh, being supported in plying this trade. Um, therefore, the leaps forward in technology and automation, while excited, are potentially leaving us at risk of uh, marginalization again. Um, therefore, increasing the numbers of seafarers, uh, ship owners, entrepreneurs, and people who say their vocation is marita uh, maritime one must become a bigger priority. Um, women too only make up a very small percentage of a maritime uh, workforce or, or um, seafaring. Beyond um, being involved in businesses, um, it's, a, it's a growth area and this needs to change. Uh, the low levels, I should say, needs to change. Um, greater opportunities for training and education, which incidentally was the World Maritime Day theme of 2015, uh, are therefore required. And here we're being held back by often the uh, lack of available training berths uh, for cadets, which means the workforce is not growing very fast relative to other parts of the world where training berths are available. Um, remember too that even having ships flying your flag at sea is no guarantee that those ships will be able to provide berths for uh, seafarers because often those ships are um, using the flag but are based or sailing in other parts of the world. Therefore, some necessary steps um, for enhancing maritime education opportunities are needed and they are being taken. For instance, in South Africa, the South African International Maritime Institute is growing and also that um, regional academies in countries such as Cote d'Ivoire and Ghana have a long history. The bottom line though for determining the success of any of these initiatives is uh, of, of, of whether in connectivity is enhancing and improving uh, African people's situation when it comes to the sea is the number of jobs added, the skills passed on, and the impact this will have on decreased levels of poverty, inequality, and unemployment. Therefore, ensuring the long-term sustainability of the ports and shipping initiatives discussed ultimately depends on whether people are included in this as the primary factor. African countries, as I say, need to be much more proactive about maximising international development and um, ensuring that maritime infrastructure is not uh, received in a passive way, um, which is not completely in our interest. Um, I'm going to conclude now by reiterating that there will be ports, they will be built, there will be more ships in the future, and there should be more people benefiting as a result, owning, operating, supporting. Better and fairer connectivity of Africa to the world is the goal and the course we need to set. It's time to weigh anchor and set sail.